Why mess around with graphite? Well, the reason is, in a nutshell, high temperatures. Uh, graphite tolerates much higher temperatures than zircaloy or stainless steel or, or any of these metals. Uh, and uh, that has a couple of advantages. One is, in, in a safety sense, uh, the designs that have come forth so far basically say that even if you stop all cooling in this thing, you just can't get it hot enough to damage the graphite because it's so temperature tolerant. Uh, temperatures uh, peaking around 1600 C, which is well below, you really get into trouble with graphite. Uh, and a second advantage is graphite cores tend to be very large, I mean, physically, X, Y, Z kind of large. And, and the reason for that, if you remember back to uh, moderating capability, uh, whereas light water was one, graphite was 0.28. So you just got to put a lot more graphite in to get the, roughly the same extent of moderation. So they tend to be just a lot fatter. Uh, graphite is, is, is tolerant of burning in air. Uh, will react with sort of a water steam reaction at elevated temperatures. Uh, and uh, one of the downsides is it, it produces a lot of carbon-14. Uh, a small fraction of carbon is naturally occurring stable carbon-13. And you put a neutron in and you get carbon-14. And carbon-14 has been an irritant in, uh, uh, in the repository and waste disposal situation for a long time. It's never, I guess to my view, been frontier, but it's, it's always nagging. And, and this reactor would have a lot of it, much more than than uh, well, light water reactors or, or what, whatever. Uh, and in the old days, we used to talk about reprocessing this stuff, and that was a real lovely possibility. Uh, I, I mentioned the uh, Bigner energy buildup, so I won't go through that song again. Uh, a second is, uh, aspect of why we want high temperatures is process heat applications. Uh, if you look down at, at the bottom here, you see uh, rough ranges of, of temperature capabilities of various reactors. This is sort of existing generation HTGRs and then the, the VHTR, which is uh, sort of uh, Gen 3 plus to Gen 4. And up above is the temperature requirements for various uh, industries. And uh, you can see by going to these reactors, you get up in the regime where you can uh, start looking at things like iron manufacture, uh, petroleum uh, refining is, is up in here, and, and I think maybe a bit higher, as well as the possibility of producing hydrogen by uh, chemical process, uh, well, first, without electrolysis, and secondly, most of the hydrogen production right now uh, happens by reforming natural gas. Well, natural gas is sort of good for some other things, and it'd be nice to be able to basically break apart water is what we're talking about, but that's a tougher nut to crack. And you can get the temperature range uh, from these reactors to help this, uh, which would, well, help the global climate issue and, and sort of reduce reliance on, uh, on fossil fuels of, of, of all kind. Uh, and uh, petroleum refineries use a lot of energy. So th these are sort of the, the driving forces for this kind of a reactor. Uh, it's gas cooled, helium's the cool and the choice, uh, inert, and for a gas it has good thermal conductivity. Uh, but it does have the low density and the volume and the pumping power required to move a gas around is, is, is more than the water. Uh, I mentioned I think some legacy designs in the UK use CO2 but they're, they're going away. Um, and you can't drive those to high temperature because the CO2 starts to dissociate. Uh, sort of a cartoon of it, and it's uh, not unobvious. This one shows uh, process heat application over here, where you go through a secondary heat exchanger. Actually, this has uh, you know, primary loop and then secondary and a, and, a, and a tertiary to isolate the radioactive stuff from whatever process you've got over here. And in this reactor, there, uh, there, there are questions being asked. You know, what is the coupling between these folks over here, which aren't going to be licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and over here? And if something happens here, can it mess up the reactor? And that 
that is, you know that hasn't been run to ground yet. It's still an issue under discussion. Uh, the other one over here is this shows a uh, uh, a Brayton cycle. The the uh, I think it's a Brayton cycle, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know a Brayton cycle and a turbine generating a, a electricity. Uh, going on. This is sort of what the core looks like, and. This is what a fuel element will look like in this kind of reactor, and I'll talk more about those later. But uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the arrangement in here. And th this is a cutaway, and the red stuff is the fuel, and all of the, the gray stuff, uh, top, bottom, and sides, and it's an annular kind of a thing, uh, is just graphite moderator uh, and, and stays in there to help reflect neutrons and help the neutron economy. Uh, as you see, it's a uh, this. Uh, reactor. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I think this this reactor might have a power level on the order of 300 megawatts electric. And you can see it's a it's a fairly tall core, 44 feet just for the core itself. I mean, this isn't vessel or anything else. Uh, and I'll talk about the fuel design in a in a bit. Uh, but because of the high temperature, it's projected to have a fairly high thermal efficiency. Uh, built by General Atomics. Passive cooling after accidents. Uh, it's got rod type control rods made of boron carbide. Uh, it's still under development to a significant extent, with uh, uh, the main issue being materials, but also optimization of temperatures. Uh, can be built in a variety of sizes uh, with their current focus at 600 megawatts thermal, which is the roughly 300 megawatts electric. And this is so, you know, which puts it puts it in the small modular reactor kind of a range, uh, and I'll talk more about those later. But this could fit into it, uh, and it's a minor upgrade of an older uh, gas turbine modular reactor that General Atomic has uh, had developed. Uh, this might be a good time to take a fifteen minute break. All right, let's take a fifteen minute break. <laughs> Uh, when we uh, uh, had our little hiatus, we had a question on the floor about basically disposition of graphite-based fuel. Uh, years ago, there, uh, in the heyday of the th uh, nuclear reactor development, there was pl a plan and, and significant work done to reprocess HTGR fuel. Uh, it, it is ugly. Uh, you, you, you have basically there's, there's three choices. You got to get rid of all this graphite. So your choices are you can burn it, <laughs> which makes a lot of C14 CO2 that you got to handle. Uh, you can try to ream out the fuel material, and I haven't described the fuel design, but you can ream it out. Or you can try to crush the whole thing and crush it enough so you can leach the, the fuel matrix out. Uh, in, in recent years and in current incarnations, there seems to be no interest in that, and they plan on disposing of uh, intact fuel. And so, how many additional waste packages would be required for the same amount of uh, the, uh, it's it's not twenty or thirty; it's more tenish. It's my it, the, the question was uh, what what's the volume increase in in the spent fuel, and it's tenish just because you got all that graphite there. And whereas in a, in a light water or any other reactor, you leave the coolant moderator behind to be re reused. So uh, I, I had one other uh, thought on Fukushima that I, I, I forgot to mention. It's, it's pretty obvious, I think, to everybody that what happened over there has significant reactor safety implications. We don't know what they all are yet, but it, and we will be finding those out. But there's also significant implications back in the fuel cycle in terms of pool storage and how much fuel should be in pool storage, how hot fuel should be in pool storage, and a whole range of questions there that's, that's also being asked. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, and I sort of think at this point, maybe we know a little bit less about what's in some of those pools than some of the reactor situations. So th that is also in play and can have ramifications for many reactor sites in the U.S. and storage and uh, dry storage and all that kind of stuff. So with that, uh, we were on what needs work on, on the VHTR. 
graphite itself is is, is not a, is not an issue. Uh, to some extent, making fuel reliable, and when I describe what, how the fuel is made, I think that'll be clear. But making the the, the fuel uh, material itself, uh, I think the biggest issue is is the metal components. While graphite is fine, and you can probably make a pressure vessel and keep it insulated, you're going to be circulating very hot helium through compressors, heat exchangers, and this kind of thing, and you went to graphite to get away from the metals and its limitations, but now you got the metals, and there's rotating machinery in most of these. Uh, maybe not the process heat so much, but uh, uh, e either uh, the uh, either of the other two. So that's the real challenge in this, and even in the Fort St. Brain experience, which was lower temperatures, that was one of their main challenges, is the, is the rotating equipment, the circulators, uh, didn't prove to be very reliable. There are a lot of countries interest, interested in these reactors, and uh, I've listed some of the major players here. So, uh, okay. Uh, and I've been talking about the VHTR, which is a reactor type. Department of Energy has a program to try to deploy one of these, and the program or project is called the next generation nuclear plant, trying to build one of these modules uh, up at the Idaho National Laboratory, electricity and process heat with a public-private par partnership, NRC licensed. Uh, they say 2021 operation, nah, nah, I'm not buying. Uh, uh, about 600 megawatts thermal. When is that, 750 to 800? I have no idea. Uh, now I want to move on and talk about fast reactors, sodium cooled. Uh, first, a uh, little bit about sodium. Uh, melting point, just about the boiling point of water. Boiling point is up 1600 uh, C, which is, uh, I'm sorry, F, which is uh, quite high. Uh, the reactor itself operates about at atmospheric pressure. Um, it has excellent heat transfer properties. It's not particularly corrosive to stainless steel, which is sort of the good news. The bad news, you can see over on the right, uh, there, there's liquid and then solid down at the bottom. It's opaque. Uh, being sodium, it reacts with air uh, and can burn. If it gets near water, it reacts violently, it makes sodium hydroxide and our friend hydrogen again, which of course likes to explode. Uh, and in the reactor, uh, a neutron, uh, uh, you capture neutrons and, and you get the sodium-24, a 15-hour 15, uh, 15 half-life, but it has a fairly hard gamma, which if you imagine the refueling situation, uh, uh, that requires you to do things differently. Uh, this is a, a, just a, a picture of one, and, and basically if, if you know, you erased a few words in it. it. It almost sort of looks like a PWR, with with a couple of exceptions. One is you, you don't need the pressure vessel, but you got the primary loop, sodium. The secondary loop is the water loop going in into a a Rankine cycle. Uh, hmm. And uh, national or internationally, there are a, a couple of different design concepts. I sort of in the previous diagram, you saw the the pool concept down here. Uh, where the, the reactor and uh, heat exchanger sets in, in a pool, uh, whereas there's the uh, loop design where this uh, heat exchanger sets outside of the vessel. Uh, I think the Japanese sort of like uh, this one up here, uh, uh, U.S. and others tend toward this because it keeps more thing in a, in basically a big vat of sodium, which helps your cooling and accident response and that kind of thing fairly high priority in, in the generation four hierarchy as opposed to some of the other reactors. Uh, for the uh, safety, uh, criticality as with some others is uh, uh, terminated by increased temperatures because of core expansion and, and the consequent more uh, neutron leakage. Sodium boiling can insert positive reactivity, which means uh, whereas boiling, say, water in a boiling water reactor is negative reactivity, it tends to want to shut it down because of the moderation. The sodium sort of removes some neutron capture and, and actually the spectrum can be harder and faster at, at that point. So it can want to sort of get away from you. Uh, this can be managed in most, most designs 
managed in most reactors by design, and I always fix it so you don't have this positive sodium void coefficient. Uh, but there are limits to it, and having U-238 in there is a, is a key presence because of its, you know, the Doppler broadening and increased ca uh, capture with temperature in those resonances. Uh, future reactors are being designed for natural sodium circulation and uh, passive heat transfer to the atmosphere. Uh, one of the uh, issues is refueling. Uh, if you were to look down in a sodium cool fast reactor with the lid popped off, I mean, you, you'd see a, well, it looks like sort of a pool of mercury kind of stuff, a silvery metal, which isn't real helpful in grabbing a hold of fuel assemblies. Uh, this is uh, one, of the, one of the ways they go about it is, of course, very precise. Uh, X, Y location on no, knowing where each one is to the, to the millimeter, but they also use ultrasonics to image, and these are the tops of the uh, tops of the assemblies, and you'll see why they look sort of funny when we get into the fuel design. Uh, it's been 30 years of experience worldwide. The U.S. had the experimental breeder reactors one and two up at Idaho. Fermi, which was a commercial plant, sort of, but probably generation two-ish, and didn't work real well. The fast flux test facility was, was just that. It did not produce power, but it was used to test materials in a fast neutron spectrum. Uh, France has had uh, Rhapsody, Phoenix, and Super Phoenix. Uh, the UK had a couple, and uh, all of these are, are shut down at this point, except the Russian, well, Japan is trying to operate Manju, and they're struggling with it. They have been struggling for years. Russia's BN350, I believe, is still operating and trying to build a BN8 eight, eight something, 850. Uh, is it the 600? Okay. Uh, the major issue with these reactors, uh, there's no theoretical problem here. The, the first is basically to, to make the thing operate reliably, to get all. Uh, to get the sodium pumps and circulators and heat exchangers and all of it just to operate reliably and then as with current generation PWRs, reduce cost, not so have much, has so much equipment in it to make it economically competitive. It's, you'll get various numbers, but the capital cost of one of these uh, seems to be estimated to be on the order of 20% more than say an LWR. Uh, and uh, they, they've sort of got to get to that. Uh, and uh, there, there are countries working on it, but one step at a time. A little bit on small <coughs> modular reactors. Uh, first, no generally agreed definition on, on how small is small enough. Uh, uh, IAEA has said less than 300 uh, megawatts electric, maybe 500 at the outside, so they're pretty vague on it. Uh, rough convention seems to be less than 600 megawatt thermal, which for a very efficient reactor is is around 300 megawatts uh, electric. Uh, and this limit seems to sort of come about because above 600 megawatts thermal, you start to have problems with natural circulation uh, in, in the cooling, uh, which a lot of them want to use. Objectives, depending on who you listen to, factory construction, by making them that small, you can, instead of having these huge pressure vessels that you got to get fabricated in Japan and shipped by barges and whatever, you can fabricate many of the components in a factory and ship, uh, you know, essentially an intact reactor out to a field site. Uh, and that's less costly than field construction, according to the proponents. Uh, and uh, they, they seem to think that, well, I shouldn't say that. There's a, want, uh, a desire to use them to, for power supply to remote sites or for small demands. If you have a country that, you know, has a total demand of 1,000 megawatts electric, you can't put a 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant, it's just you need something more flexible in uh, pieces and parts. Uh, and also possibly Department of Defense and remote locations or Alaska has talked about it and this kind of stuff. Uh, they want them to be passively safe. Uh, a number of them uh, are offering proliferation resistance advantages in terms of, gee, we'll, we'll ship you, you know, the reactor with this core and the core will last for 10 years or 15, and then we'll just take the entire core back to the U.S. and put a new one in, or the entire reactor, that kind of an approach. Uh, and uh, build a module at a time. If you need 1,000, 1,200 megawatts, well, you can build 300 now. In a few years, build 300 more and have the first one operating and generating some revenue. Uh, because the nuclear power plant construction is, 
you know, for a utility, the, the really huge risk is, is the upfront capital cost. Uh, where when you're talking billions of dollars and, and you're financing the whole thing, it's a pretty huge mortgage and, and a big risk for them to take. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one design, uh, a new scale. Uh, it's basically just a, 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 a shrunk up, uh, shrunken PWR is what it is. About the same kind of a fuel design, uh, refueling. They say they can keep it running for uh, 30 months, which is a bit long. But th this seems to have some, some effort behind it. But, uh, and uh, these designs, the more advanced, oh, rats, take me back again, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> that trigger down there is in the worst position. Uh, these tend to have uh, integral steam generators, which means they put the steam generator inside of this vessel, which is in, in sort of a tank. This is the pressure vessel in, inside of the thing, and then just a, a big water tank. And the core is way down here. Uh, cooling is, is natural circulation and hope for a license application. Well, they said late last year, and I'm unsure if they got it in. Uh, Another one is the M Power. This is Babcock and Wilcox, which is one of the traditional PWR vendors. Uh, I don't. I do not believe they're. I'm pretty sure they're not selling full-scale PWRs anymore. But they've come up with this design called M Power. Looks an awful lot like the one you one you just saw. Saw again. It has the uh, inter integral steam generators, and it's it's this design that TVA is considering at the old Clinch River breeder reactor site. Uh, now there's, there's a lot of discussion going on. There's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of conditions various parties want in order to proceed with this thing. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, I guess l let me pause and, and maybe offer a, a couple of thoughts on these SMRs. Uh, you'll see in, in the background material first, I've, I've got information on a whole bunch of other SMRs that I sort of consider to be further down the road. And some of them might be 10 years down the road. A, a few of them, I, I frankly think, are, are totally whacked out. Uh, they, they have cores in for 50 years and just really strange kind of designs. Uh, secondly, for most of these, you can find very little information. Uh, usually reactors that are under development, at, at some point you start seeing reports and papers that give the basic reactor specifications, thermal power, electric power, and power densities, and sort of what their fuel cycle is. And all we're seeing in most of these is cartoons uh, and, and just, just no real depth. Uh, finally, the, the Nuclear Energy Agency within the last week or two issued a report on small modular reactors. Uh, and for, for those that don't know, the, there's the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which, it, which the membership of it is about the 25, roughly, most industrialized countries in the world. And they, they address all sorts of issues. A subpart of it is the Nuclear Energy Agency that works on nuclear issues, as you might expect. And the countries get together and sort of prepare consensus technical reports. And they are reasonably technical. And the report that came out, they looked at the economics of these SMRs, or a couple of the more advanced ones, like Empower and, and, and New Scale. And their conclusion was they were unlikely to be economic uh, in, in normal applications. They might find use in specialized applications, like remote or, or whatever. <clears throat> and, but the, the, the reasoning was that even though you could have some factory fabrication, they were simply too small to get the economies of scale you see in a, in a thousand megawatts. Uh, and that report's uh, available on their website someplace if you want to chase that further. Uh, legacy reactors, uh, a couple of these. One, one is an RBMK. This is the Russian design. Uh, you see the Russian there, and it's a high power channel reactor. Uh, this, uh, and what we, you see a cartoon of it here. Uh, let me get more to the description. It's a graphite moderated, light water cooled, <coughs> uh, pressurized water react, falling water reactor. 
And so you've got this big bunch of graphite in there. You got channels in the graphite, and the channels are lined with zircaloy pressure sleeves. And then you put fuel assemblies that look more or less normal in these channels, and it goes critical with rods and the, and, the, and this kind of stuff. Uh, there were uh, 18 of these built. Uh, got myself a typo there. Uh, and, and this is the uh, Chernobyl reactor. Uh, and by design, this reactor had some problems. Uh, first, it had a positive void co uh, coefficient in some places, which means if you start boiling it, you know, the reactor and reactivity gets worse. And it didn't, at, at the outset, it didn't have any real containment, more like the secondary containment on uh, BWRs. Uh, and after TMI, just, just partial containment. Uh, this accident, uh, th there's still, even after these many years, some uncertainty. There's been more than one official report, and they like to disagree, so that's, that's a problem. Uh, basically, the reactor was operating at low power, and the operator de deviated from the test procedures. Uh, and with the design flaws of, of positive void coefficient, and apparently the, the control rods before they get to the new, if you're moving them, before you get the neutron poison in the reactor, there's a space where positive reactivity is actually inserted because there's a water gap and the water moderates things better. So they were moving these rods around and the nuclear reaction went out of control, leading to steam explosions and fires. Again, you got the zircaloy in there and the zircaloy fuel that can do evil things to you. And I think, you, you know, the aftermath, it took many hours to extinguish it, and a lot of our responders died because of the radiation level, and it spread a fair amount of radiation around, um, much more than the uh, Japanese uh, situation. Uh, but th these aren't being built, and uh, nobody wants much of any part of them. Uh, a little bit on reactor deployment. Uh, reasonably current information on, on where, where reactors are, and where they're trying to build reactors, which is over here in the middle. And you'll see an awful lot of activity in the Far East, some in the Middle East, in some fairly small countries. Uh, Central and, and Eastern Europe are all very active. So a lot of the worldwide growth at this point uh, and, and things that are under construction, which is, which is the middle column, is happening elsewhere. But there is a lot of activity. So. Uh, they're headed in that direction. Uh, and I'm not going to go through these backup slides in favor of getting to the uh, fuels presentation. So could we rack up number four?